Good morning, everybody. It's great to be back here. Worshiping here, God with all you all. To those online and in the building, it's wonderful to be back with you all. My family and I recently went on a road trip. We covered over 6,000 miles from one coast to the other coast of this nation. And it was wonderful to see some family we hadn't seen in years. That meant a lot. We returned it all 10 fingers and all 10 toes, and we're still relatively sane, so we'll call it a success. But as long journeys turn out to be sometimes, it was an adventure. In those journeys, some things happened. It got me to thinking and led to this sermon. And today, honestly, it's partly me trying to process those events. But I hope this will be of use to some others, and I hope there's some practical application for all of us. But that said, let's begin. Start with a simple question. What are we? Now, we all know the flesh and blood, the bones, this meat suit that we wear. We got that. But there's more to it. And I think that we sometimes forget who we truly are, what we truly are. So let's go way back to the beginning, the very beginning of things. And let's start with Genesis. Genesis 1, in fact. And let's do Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Should Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And it begins. And then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every other living thing that moves on the earth. In the very beginning, we're made special. We're all made in the image of God. Our physical bodies may look quite different from each other, but our souls, those all start off as incredibly beautiful creations from God, in God's image the image of the Almighty God. No matter what we do, deep down, God's nature is there. And it's what underlies all the junk we add on top of it that hides our true nature. God made us to be like Him. And that's how we start. That's the very beginning of it all, Genesis 1. Now, if that's where we start, where do we go? Where do we end up? And for that, let's flip over to the New Testament. Let's go to Romans 8. I love Romans 8. You know that it's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Let's go to Romans 8, starting in verse 12. Romans 8, starting in verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you not receive the spirit of bondage again into fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. God made a path for us to come back to him. A path to shed all the junk we pile on that hides who we truly are. He made us to be his children. We get out to our Abba, which is basically a term of endearment. We get to say, Papa, Daddy, Father, to the Almighty God. That is amazing. We start by coming from God, and we're meant to end up going back to Him. We're supposed to choose our way to go back to God. He sets us free so we can freely choose to love Him. 
Now, we all know these facts, right? These are all simple, simple premises of life. The path is simple. Choice is real easy. So what happened in this world? Why are there so few who realize the obvious and make the right choice? Why are there so many who go so far from God? How do we end up so far apart from God and from each other? And I think the answers to those questions are simple too, to start off with. We forget. We look away. Now, keep your hands down. Don't actually say it because it kind of... How many of you have drifted off and thought about something else since we started talking? Yeah, I can tell. I do the same thing. It's human nature, right? Probably 100% of us. Now, we joke about dogs using me as tractors and go, twirl! <laughs> we humans do it too, don't we? We're, it's very natural to wander and to think and to, and to get lost and daydream. Even if something's right in front of us, it's very easy. It's one of the reasons God gave us a sermon of the communion. Brother Charles, you described so beautifully today. That event, so momentous, so important, because it reminds us time and time again, look back to God, look back to eternity. You know why you're here, that gift of salvation. We do it every time we come together because it's so important. And we need that. We need that reminder. We need that memorial. So how does something so simple, so easily done, that humans are so prone to do, go from something innocent, innocuous is something that can ruin a soul. And I think the answer to that is kind of simple too. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And we'll begin down in verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, get verse 15. And it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Some of those verses in a few short words, what distracts us? Ooh, shiny. It is, right? It's so easy to get lost in the visceral things. Our senses, we can touch it, we can feel it, we can taste it. It's hard to lay hands on the eternity, our soul. But it's there. We can't forget that. So let's recap this basic set of facts. We come from God, and we're to represent Him. We're made in His image for a reason. We're supposed to be like Him. His nature, His his point of view, his view of things. Now, we're meant to do a U-turn and go back to him, right? Very simple. We're meant to end up back with God by freely choosing him. We come down here, we get lost in this world, and then we're supposed to find our way back. That's how it's supposed to work. He gave us that path. He gave us that ability. But, we get distracted, don't we? Those quick things that are passing away, those things that are fleeting by, we forget where we came from. We forget where we're supposed to be. Sometimes we even forget God. This is life. This is how it works. You've got one path, and you find your way back, you make your way back home, and you veer off, and you get lost in the woods. Somebody's trying to call him and hissing in too, so that's good. With life, we either keep our eye on the goal and make it back or we get lost along the way. And the real scare of hell is that this is not God. God's not there. That is the real scary part about it. It's not making it back home. It's not making it to where we're supposed to be. We're not with the God who loves us. As children of God, we can all understand these things. It's very simple. We all know this. We can all agree on these basic premises of how life works. Now, we start with something very simple, basic framework. It's how we can understand life and what we know about life. We're dealing with some really simple and easy concepts, right? 
So let's dive in. We've been doing easy. Let's go straight to something hard, something difficult. Let's turn to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, turn to verse 43 and 40 through 45. Matthew 5, begin to verse 43. And it reads, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, and this is Jesus speaking, Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's a hard challenge that Jesus is throwing down at our feet, right? That is not easy. But let's apply some of our basic facts from that simple framework. And see if it'll help us accept that challenge. Where does our enemy start off? They start as a soul from God, made in the image of God, to be like God. Where are they meant to be at the end? They're meant to be back with God. Sometimes we don't admit that, but they are. They're meant to be back with God. That's the truth. How did they get to the state they're in? They got distracted. They lost their way. They chose the wrong path. They got far off the path back home. They're a lost soul. The truth is they're to be pitied. Show them the way back to the path back home and pray for their soul that it doesn't remain lost. Now, at the very least, even in a sad situation, they don't find their way back home. We keep the situation in perspective, right? Knowing that basic premise. So we don't let them take up our headspace. We don't let them take up room free of rent. That'll distract us from our journey from us getting back home, right? At the very least, we gotta make it to our, back, our home. We gotta get back with God. Now, that's abstract, right? That's easy. Faceless, nameless enemy. Let's take this into reality. Let's, let me explain why I picked this topic. My family made the Coast Cup trip before. Stopped in lots of places all over this country been lots of different places. This time was different. People are angry out there. People are divided. This country is headed in a dangerous direction. And too many people are getting too far off that path back to God. It's kind of worrisome. So I've been thinking about like this, this a lot. When you're going across country, you meet a lot of people. You always get the mixture some really friendly folks, some really rude folks. People are human. You never know who you're gonna meet from day to day and what day, kind of day they're having when you meet them. That's to be expected. Now, it's almost like people choose. They, it's a point of pride to just choose stupid. And I don't know why, but it is and it's happening. On this trip, on the light end of things, some people refuse a service. Take a look at us, see a mask, see Jeannie, she's from evasion descent, they would turn their back and they'd walk away. They wouldn't see a human wanting food, wanting to buy something, needing to ask a question. They would just, nothing. He didn't exist. This was so common, we actually changed the way we did things. Whenever you went to something simple, you go into a gas station, you gotta use the restroom, you gotta get a drink. I wouldn't let the girls go in without me or Alex with them. Just in case it went beyond rudeness into something else. And it did. Let's talk about one of those. Which brings us to the other end of the dialogue. Those guys that got kind of dangerous. Times it got a little bit scary. There's this lovely guy in North Carolina. He decided there's a van with a, a family with a minivan with a California tag, and he was gonna do his best to run us off the road. And he nearly did it. How do you get so stupid to run somebody off the road because of the tag? But this guy was doing it. He was running it, and he was bound and determined to do it. And until he almost got hit, we almost went off the road. Now, I admit, I had a really hard time applying Jesus' command in that moment. That dude could have hurt 
or kill me and my family. Why something so stupid? I've been thinking about this and other events on the trip a lot. In the van, in that moment, I failed to meet the challenge. I was angry. There was no love for that fellow at the time. I didn't curse him. But I was not about to bless him. <laughs> Jesus is much, much stronger than I am. We're a bit distance from the bed. The guy's on the other side of the country. So let's take a look at this in retrospect. Let's take a moment and see if I can meet the challenge in retrospect from a distance. Let's apply our framework, our basic facts that we've got, that we all agree on. Where did this guy come from? And honest truth, I had to revise this section a few times to keep from just saying, this guy. <laughs> Where did he start off? I know what I like to think of where he started off. You know, the truth is he came from God. He was a soul. He was an innocent babe at one point in his life. No one comes out of the womb and tries to and thinks, contemplates attempting to be a clear manslaughter. It doesn't happen. No baby's thinking that. So no matter what I think of him, he is a soul from God also. I have to accept that fact. It's a start for the rest of the framework, too, and for the rest of the framework to make sense. It's also the truth. He has intrinsic value as a soul from God. All souls that come from God have value, simply because of where they came from and who made them. And yeah, I can say that with a straight face now, but it's hard. It's not easy to remember, especially not in that moment, is it? Let's turn back. Let's go back to our structural manual for a moment. Turn me to Genesis 9, back in the beginning. Genesis 9, starting in verse 5. Surely, for your life, bud, I would demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast, I require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother, I require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood will be shed. For in the image of God, he, talking about God, made man. That very first criminal sentence, the reason that thing is so clear is because the intrinsic value of who each human is, the cause of who made us and how they made us. Human souls have value because we're made by God and we're very sinners of God. We have to have respect for God. So let's look at the next part of the framework. Where is this guy meant to be at the end? Now, where is I thought he would be in the moment? In the end of things, where is he supposed to be? He is meant to be back with God. Being a soul from God, he belongs back with God. We all do. I swear soul naturally belongs. What is actually telling me is he's not on the right track, though. So how did he get in that state to be in there, to be in that area? I don't know. I don't know what caused him to get off the path and lose his way. I don't know if this is a one-time spur of the moment or if he does this regularly. I sure hope not. Only God knows the hearts of men. I don't. What I do know is he appears to be very lost. If a car attack can set him off on such a path like that, something's wrong. In retrospect, when I think about it, Imagine the pain that someone has to be going through to do something like that. Imagine the insecurity, the whatever he's going through in his life that caused him to do that. Right? He had to have been doing something. Something had to have been going on. Assuming this is not a one-time event, where he'll end up is without God's love, without God. And that's an incredibly sad and pitiable place to end up being. So with some distance, with some perspective, we're using our framework that we're talking about here, the basic one that God gave us about how to understand life. If you bear with me, let's try to apply some of that, do some application. In the moment, it didn't do so well, but let's try it right now. At the very least, God commands us to pray for him. So if you would, pray for me and pray for this man. Let's take a moment, if you're okay.
Let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I come for you now to ask for your forgiveness for me for not being as strong as Jesus, not being able to maintain a calm demeanor in the time of stress. Please forgive us when we do not live up to the standards you have set before us, Father. Please give us the strength, the understanding, the wisdom to be able to be more like you, Father. Father, please be the man who came after me and my family. Father, I can only imagine the pain that he's going through, the guy in the state to take action that he did. Father, please forgive him for his actions. Please allow him to find you, to turn his life around. Father, please let someone shine a light, the light of your love in his life. Show him a better way. Show him the right path. Father, please bless him. Please take away the pain that causes him to take part in a direction that leads away from you, Father. Please help him to find you. Father, please be with us all. Let us all work to strive to remember who we are, where we belong, and always remember to focus on you and where we've got to work to get away back to at all times, Father. So we do not lose sight of the path that leads back to you. We love you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. With that, let's leave this part of the discussion. Let's move onward. Let's go from details and generalize some of the use of this framework. In our world, in our country, in our cities, in our communities, sometimes even in our families, we're becoming divided, becoming angry with each other. We're at odds for things that seem so simple, sometimes reasons that do not even make sense. For example, wear a mask. Should it be such a simple, innocuous thing? It should not matter to other person. It should be a personal choice. Not an issue for others. But it's become a big dividing line in this country. It's become much more than a simple piece of material. It's almost like gang colors. What you believe, what you, what you stand for. It's come so far from what it actually is about, personal health. How do we get there? What if? Instead of flaring up with anger with each other, remember who we are, who they are, when we flared up in love, forgiveness. What if our leaders, instead of holding up Bibles, actually read them? And they actually stood for what they talk about. Would the people who want to leave this country be so angry that those people, other people's souls need to come back to God? where they belong with God? What if we, as members of a supposedly civil society, did the same thing and viewed others like this? What if we work and catch ourselves when we get worked up? And instead of getting angry with whoever we see as the other side, we remember to think of them as souls. We need to get back to God. Hopefully, we'll catch ourselves. We'll not be as angry with them. We're better equipped to deal with them as Christ wants us to. Show them love instead of hate. On a practical level, let's talk for just a brief moment about geopolitics, and I'll leave alone with that. But first, a moment, history. I see some books, now I won't go there. But in history, in World War I, Vladimir Lenin formed an office in Soviet Russia, specially purposed with full mitten. Division, getting countries so divided, so worked up amongst themselves that they fell apart and they could reshape them to what they wanted them to be. Now, we'd be crazy to think that that lesson has been forgotten. Our own country's used it, but it's still being used today. If we don't learn to have more patience, more understanding, and we continue on the path that we're on, we're going directly in the hands of our geopolitical enemy. We're weakening our country. We're messing with ourselves. I'll leave that alone. We'll move away from that. Looking at other souls, we need to make the way back to God is good for us also. On a day-to-day -day practical level. We can be more patient. We can show more love to others. 
And this will make our community stronger, better for us and our neighbors. We can have more peace in ourselves when we try to look through the world as God did, through a lens of eternity, and that far vision of what really matters, and not just our narrow view of what the here and now. Events on the road trip are just that. They're events. They're temporary. They're time-bound. They're fleeting. Those events that I really, on this road trip that I really want to remember, spending time with family, getting to see people that I love, people, the laughs, the time with them. That's more important than the other events that happen, and that's what we're supposed to focus on. And God tells us to focus on the good. As always, He's right. Turn to Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Philippians 4, 8 through 9, beginning in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Interestingly, this advice is not just how you should look at memories and events. It's actually how we're supposed to look at each other too. If we're souls from God, we're supposed to look for the best in each other. And there's this thing called positive feedback. You add that praise for the virtue. It actually helps draw it out. Helps make it show up more often. Instead of being social media influenced about fashion and makeup and all this other stuff, what if we influence each other to do good, to show love? We influence each other for the right reasons. Reveal that core of God's nature that lies within us all. It's how our soul starts. Wrapping up this message, I want to thank you for bearing with me as I worked through some things and thought through. It's helped me. I don't know if it helped anybody else, but thank you. One last look at the framework. To understand life, the main point is to remember this. God gave us all souls. We all need to try to make our way back to him. We've got to make that U-turn and get back there. It's where we belong. It's where we we need to be. We need to never take our eyes off the path back to Him. And maybe we show love to others. Maybe we help them lead back the path that lead them back to God. This morning, or any time, if you make the decision to make your way back to God, there's always water available. You can always choose that path, make it official with baptism. Also, if you ever taken your eyes off God, off the path, and need prayers of the congregation, we're glad to pray for you. If there's anything you do, anything you need for us to do, please come forward, either in person or online, as we stand and we sing. Thank you.